Please, ladies and gentlemen, take your seats. Just uh, want to welcome you all to this uh, keynote session and keynote address by uh, Arlene Foster, leader of Democratic Unionist Party, an awkward relationship, unionism and the rest of the UK. It's my privilege to know you many years, I think, and only since the time you were Arlene Kelly. And yes. uh, <laughs> so that uh, when I first interviewed you uh, a long time ago there in uh, Fermanagh, and uh, nobody, of course, uh, from your own family experiences knows uh, the price of maintaining the union more than yourself. It's a privilege to be able to have you here Thank keynoting. Um, you've been uh, the utmost assistance to this conference and uh, look forward, uh, along with everyone else, hearing what you have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Dean, for that warm welcome. It's lovely to be here and I was here a little early so I had the opportunity to listen to the last panel debate. Uh, wonderful to listen to that. Um, but I want to talk about um, an awkward relationship, ultra unionism and the rest of the United Kingdom today. And Northern Ireland is enjoying uh, relative peace uh, and a growing number of people uh, see being part of the United Kingdom uh, as the best way forward. And I think uh, the polling underlined that today. Uh, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland all have unique qualities and different emphasis, but we are stronger together uh, and, uh, than any individual part uh, standing on their own. Uh, Dean has mentioned Fermanagh and I travelled here from my home in County Fermanagh and Fermanagh is, for those of you who are unaware of the geography of Northern Ireland, the furthest west you can get in Northern Ireland and it's very much on the edge of the United Kingdom. Uh, we might have different accents and there might be a bit less hustle and bustle uh, than here in London, but Fermanagh is every bit as much an integral part of uh, the Union as our nation's capital. I was born in County Fermanagh. I often walked across the Irish border because it was just three miles away from my home. And during the early years of my life, just as Northern Ireland was on the edge of Union geographically, it often felt that it was hanging over the edge politically and indeed constitutionally as well. Now as a child I observed my parents' unionism and their loyalty was very much uh, to the United Kingdom. Our home was a household where loyalty and allegiance were to the fore. Uh, my father served Queen and Country by being a member of the Royal Ulster Constabulary uh, and being proud to put that uniform on and defend democracy against terror, saw him shot at the door of our family home by the IRA. Now, I remember distinctly uh, my father crawling into our kitchen with blood streaming from his head, and I didn't fully understand the troubles at that time. I was just eight years of age. Uh, but I realized that the enemies of the Union had tried to kill my father. Now, a moment like that often has the capacity to shape a child's thinking growing up. And like thousands and thousands and thousands of people across Northern Ireland during the Troubles, I was determined that no bullet or bomb would dampen our loyalty, our unionism, or indeed our Britishness. Yet the relationship between unionism in Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom has at times been strained. Northern Ireland's unionists will have considered down the years uh, and perhaps will have been considered down through the years and perhaps still so today as being hard to understand or relate to. But if we appeared uh, a little different, there were understandable reasons. Unionists felt little loved uh, and saw dangers at every turn. Everyone seemed out to get us, some in the Irish Republic, some of our own neighbours in their own hometowns and villages. International opinion too was perceived to be against unionism and indeed some in North uh, America in particular. And sadly, Westminster governments were less than supportive. And when our own government in the past acted against our interests and over our heads, it was those hurts which often ran the deepest. Our relationship I believe has developed and matured over the years, often through the experience of uh, difficult times. And today Northern Ireland is a world apart from the years of the Troubles uh, and the dark days of sectarian tension. 
We have come far, and yet we have a further journey to travel. Unionists want to take steps on that journey. Politically, uh, the Democratic Unionist Party, now the main party of unionism in Northern Ireland, is playing its part in ensuring that national government is able to govern at this most crucial time in the history of the United Kingdom. We have been able to use our influence at Westminster to make a difference, yes, to the lives of the people of Northern Ireland, but we've also demonstrated that our priority is to help bring stability and sensible government to our nation. Our confidence and supply agreement with the Conservative and Unionist Party was about much more than Northern Ireland. So, for example, we ensured that pensioners in every part of the country have the security of knowing that the triple lock on pensions is safe and that winter fuel payments will remain universal. And we've also held the government to their commitment on maintaining defence spending. So for us, our unionism doesn't end at the Irish Sea. We are bringing that same philosophy of doing what is in the nation's best interest to the other challenges that the United Kingdom faces over the course of this current parliament. So of course, Brexit. And in June 2016, the United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union. And we voted in the referendum as one nation. And therefore, we must implement the decision as one nation. Again, Northern Ireland has become a central element to that debate. But unionists throughout Northern Ireland, those who voted remain and leave, accept that we must exit the European Union in a way that causes no damage to the economic and constitutional integrity of the United Kingdom. And in particular, the Prime Minister has been categorical in this regard. We will not support a withdrawal agreement that creates a legal protocol with a new regulatory border down the Irish Sea, which would act as an impediment to Northern Ireland businesses trading to Great Britain, or indeed Great Britain uh, trading into Northern Ireland. That red line, as it's been called, is grounded not only in constitutional reality, but also in good economic sense. Now, there's little doubt that delivering on the referendum result is perhaps the most substantial and complex process that the government and parliament has undertaken in recent times. And we want to maximise the opportunities that will flow, we believe, from our exit from the European Union. We want to see more flexibility for locally elected ministers to set policies that work for all of the regions. And as a unionist, I see no logic or rationale for a hard border being created between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Indeed, we do not want to see that at all. In fact, the only people stirring up the myths of border checkpoints are those who are committed to unpicking the Union. They seek to use such imagery to advance and build support for their long-term political objective. They will not succeed. Some have sought to use the UK exit from the European Union as a means to, sadly, ferment division in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is transformed, and whilst we should never be complacent, the prevailing feeling of constantly being under siege is no longer the case. Unionism, of course, is at its best when it is confident, outward-looking uh, and welcoming, and we must move forward with that confidence. Citizenship and rights are essentially unionist issues. They are issues we should set out to reclaim. Nationalism is by its nature narrow and exclusive, and being a unionist is the opposite. Unionism stands for pluralism and multiculturalism, and we are inclusive and welcome all. That should be our strapline. Confident unionism can capture the diversity that nationalism cannot. It transcends nationalism and allows individuals to express the cultural values or identity that they wish. So on Saturday in my home county, I saw a very good example of a space for everyone. And whilst I was transfixed to the television and celebrating the royal wedding of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, others in Fermanagh were attending the quarterfinals of the Ulster Gaelic Championship in Enniskillen uh, between Fermanagh and Monaghan, uh, Fermanagh and Armagh, sorry. And there is space, even in Little Fermanagh, to do both. Uh, and I think that that shows a respect for each other that can be built upon. 
The surest way to cement the union is for Northern Ireland to be open and provide a successful environment in which to live and work. A Northern Ireland which embraces differing cultures and where minorities feel valued, that is one the few will choose to abandon. Now I want to be a leader who reaches out to promote the value and the values of the union. 23 years ago, I know I look too young, 23 years ago I penned the uh, foreword for a booklet entitled Selling Unionism Home and Away. And it included articles from a number of the eminent contributors, including some speaking at today's event. And I've always been seized by the importance of making the positive case uh, for the union. By today's standards, of course, the UK is not a large country in population terms, but our influence extends to every part of the globe. The union has brought us safety, stability, security, and success for all of us. And in an ever-changing world with challenge and uncertainty, that safety, security, stability and success has never been more crucial. And we have faced great challenges before, external, even existential threats, but we overcame them and we were able to do so because we stood together as uh, one against those threats. Now I am hugely proud to be British, to be part of this union that has endured for centuries, for my culture, heritage and identity to be British. But our Britishness is much more than the passport which we hold. It cannot and should not be reduced to a name or a badge. Uh, it's about a shared history going back generations. Pride in a United Kingdom which was the home of the Industrial Revolution, which founded the welfare state. It's about a shared cultural experience which encompasses the newspapers we read, the television we watch and the sporting teams which we support. A global history manifested through the Commonwealth, something which of course there will have a renewed focus upon and attention as we leave the European Union. It's about the institutions we cherish like the National Health Service which of course is the envy uh, of others. It's about a pride in our role for the good in the world, not just two world wars and the struggle against communism in the past, but the battle for freedom and democracy today. What knits us together isn't a common political creed, one religion or the same skin color. We are bound together by a set of common values, values like democracy, freedom, and a respect for the rule of law and tolerance for others. For us, those things don't need to be codified in a, a written constitution. They are the beating heart of who we are as a society and what makes us British. Our democratic system has stood the test of time over centuries and Westminster uh, remains an inspiration for fledging democracies everywhere. And the union has allowed people from all of its parts, including Northern Ireland, to make a contribution to political, economic, and cultural life that otherwise they might not have been able to do. I know, and we've heard a little bit of it earlier on, uh, that some see Northern Ireland's relationship with the rest of the United Kingdom as more take than give. Uh, and certainly in an economic and financial sense, the United Kingdom has allowed the sharing of wealth and prosperity, not just between people, but across our entire country that Northern Ireland has been a huge beneficiary of. But my belief in uh, and support for the United Kingdom does not just depend on economic arguments, though there can be no doubt that it is overwhelmingly the case that we are all economically better together uh, than apart. And it would completely defy logic to decouple Northern Ireland from what is today the fifth largest economy in the world. But Northern Ireland's people and businesses pay into the Exchequer like their counterparts in every part of the Kingdom. But our co contribution to the Union cannot simply be measured in pounds and pence alone. It is measured in the blood sacrifice at the Somme and Messines and across Flanders fields during the Great War, in the leadership on the battlefield of great leaders like Montgomery and Allenbrook, and in the engineering excellence of the men and women of Belfast who built the ships and planes that helped win the Second World War. It is measured in the enrichment of our cultural life made by writers like C.S. Lewis and Seamus Heaney. 
It is measured in the contribution of our eminent scientists, people like Lord Kelvin, the founder of modern physics, and Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who discovered pulsars. And it is measured uh, in the industry and innovation of our entrepreneurs today. Our modern day industrialists like William Wright, whose company Wright Bus manufacture one in three of the famous London Red Buses. And Peter Fitzgerald, whose life sciences company Randox makes one in ten of the world's cholesterol tests. So one of the keys to the success of our union is that Northern Ireland, like Scotland and Wales, can exert an influence, can have a voice and can play a valuable role well beyond our smaller size would otherwise merit. The overwhelming majority of the people in Northern Ireland understand and appreciate that they're better off within the United Kingdom. They also understand and greatly appreciate the incomparable contribution that the rest of the UK makes to Northern Ireland. And I am immensely proud of our shared history, history but equally I am optimistic and excited about our future together. And the great thing about our nation is that it has not remained rigid, uh, unable or unwilling to change, but it has exhibited an ability to adapt. But what has been fixed firm are those principles that I've referred to, those common values of democracy, freedom and tolerance. So the United Kingdom of 2018 is a, a very different place to the one of 1801 or 1707 and in no more obvious a way, obviously, than how we are governed. We have been uh, brought together in political union, yet today the four constituent parts of our kingdom, uh, three of them anyway, have devolved institutions with very different political complexions. As many of you know, Northern Ireland has been without uh, a devolved government for over a year. The reasons for its collapse are many and complex, but the range of cultural and other issues can, and I believe will, be fixed. And I'm determined to ensure that that's the case in the time ahead. So in closing then, can I say that our union of nations of the United Kingdom has been one of the most successful in the history of nations. And if we are to continue to thrive and to work together, we need to continue to make the case for that, whether in Northern Ireland, or in Scotland, or indeed in England and Wales. And our people need to be reminded of the benefits of and the values that shape our nation. For our part, uh, we will continue to make the case and argue uh, for policies that grow our economy, reward uh, ambition and aspiration, and benefit individuals who work hard so they see real reward uh, for their labours. Because I believe over the next decade, the United Kingdom has the opportunity to reassert itself on the global stage. And together, we can achieve great things in the years ahead. Thank you very much. A great pleasure to call upon Therese Villiers, former Secretary of State, respond. I very much welcome the chance to follow on from that thought-provoking and, and powerful contribution from Arlene Foster and delighted to be taking part in this important policy exchange conference on the Union and on Brexit. The 300-year-old Union of the Four Nations of the United Kingdom is one of the most successful political partnerships in modern history and many of the huge benefits that we as a nation have gained from it have been ably set out in the speech we've just heard. We should be proud of this country's great past and optimistic for its future. Proud of what we've achieved over the centuries and confident about the role, the role that we can continue to play on the world stage. Our union of four constituent nations is a key foundation of our strength. One united kingdom made up of four distinctive parts, but with a common history and a shared destiny, bound together, as Arlene said in her remarks, by the values of democracy, freedom, and respect for the rule of law. 
The Brexit voters divided opinion in every part of our country, but what we need to do now is to bridge the divisions which the referendum revealed. Of course, we must ensure that the result is respected, but that doesn't mean disregarding the views and concerns of the 48% who voted remain. Make a success of this huge decision that the country's made requires compromise as we shape our new partnership with our European neighbours, and our goal should be to create a new settlement with Europe with which the majority of people in this country can feel comfortable. Um, the Brexit voters divided opinion in every part of our country, but it is important to bridge those divisions. And of course, a vital question to be settled relates to the Irish border. This is, there is increasing concern that some are seeking to exploit this issue as a means to further the negotiating aims of the EU and to force us to stay in the customs union and the single market against our will. Um, just as uh, Brexit is divided opinion in, in the UK across, across the board, it's divided opinion in Northern Ireland, but support remains strong in Northern Ireland for the political settlement established under the Belfast Agreement and its successes. As the poll published today in The Telegraph shows, backing for a united Ireland remains at modest levels, well short of the level required to necessitate a border poll. Even more clear is the rock-solid support in Northern Ireland for the principle that its future should only ever be decided by democracy and by consent. I don't accept the claim that Brexit might weaken that resolve or precipitate a return to violent confrontation. That is the underlying allegation of those who seek to assert that leaving the EU could lead to a return to the Troubles. And I would caution those who make that claim. That caution was also expressed clearly by Nobel Prize winner Lord Trimble only a few weeks ago. There's every reason to believe that the disparate and small groupings who still attempt terrorist attacks will continue to find themselves condemned by the vast majority of the broader community. And that profound lack of popular support will continue to stunt the ability of these individuals to do harm, together with the resolute determination of the police and the intelligence services to prevent terror plots from coming to fruition. There is a security reason why we should seek to avoid any new infrastructure at the border, but that is not the fear of a return of the troubles of the past. It's the need to ensure that we do not endanger officials charged with erecting, maintaining, or operating any such infrastructure. All sides are agreed on the importance of avoiding unnecessary new division in the island of Ireland and preventing economic life in the border areas from being disrupted. But it is important to note that there is already a border in Ireland. Even though it's barely visible, there's a border for the purposes of tax, excise duties, taxes, currency and security. And the risks around these are managed largely through a cooperation between authorities on north and south, rather than any physical checks at the border. In the summer last year, the UK published a workable proposal for ensuring that the Irish border remains as free-flowing and open as it is now. The key aspects of that plan are streamlined customs arrangements deploying the latest technology, mutual recognition of trusted trader schemes, and an exemption for small local traders carrying out what is essentially local business which just happens to cross a border. The head of HMRC, John Thompson, told the House of Commons Brexit Committee that this would cover the vast majority of North-South trade and that, quote, if there were any checks, they would be risk and intelligence based and they would take place well away from the legal border. Similar statements have been expressed by Niall Cody, head of the Irish Revenue Service, and by Lars, Carl by Lars Carlson, a former director of the World's Customs Organization, who was commissioned by the European Parliament to look into this important issue. Mr. Carlson told MPs that modern technology means that physical customs posts are no longer essential at a border. He envisaged and said the use of mobile phone and GPS technology to track HGVs together with a computer-based customs clearing system, the norm across much of the world. He pointed out that arrangements without physical infrastructure have been successfully trialled on the Norway-Sweden border, and the reason why they haven't yet been adopted is because the existing arrangements there are viewed as sufficient. 
Even without the introduction of the latest smart border technology, the vast majority of goods which are traded internationally are dealt with remotely from borders via trusted trader and authorised economic operator schemes. It's already the case that less than 5% of goods coming from outside the EU into the UK are subject to checks at the border. I'd also highlight that the landmark WTO trade facilitation agreement was adopted by the EU in 2017. That places a binding obligation on signatories to cooperate with their neighbours to try to make trade across customs borders as smooth and seamless as possible. All of this points to the conclusion that with common sense and cooperation, there is no need for the introduction of a so-called hard border on the island of Ireland. Technology plus a small trader exemption can deliver the, the solution we need to keep the border open. So the barriers to settling this question with the EU are now political, not practical. A point well made in the impressive paper for policy exchange recently produced by Graham Gudgeon and Ray Bassett called Getting Over the Line. But as Arlene pointed out in her speech, preparing for the UK's departure from the EU is one of the most complex and substantial tasks faced by any UK government in recent history. And the road out of the EU is inevitably the subject of uncertainty and controversy, and of course it continues to be bitterly resisted by some. But we shouldn't lose sight of the big disadvantages that would come with staying in. The EU will only ever have one direction of travel towards more centralisation, more harmonisation and more Europe. Indeed, for Eurozone countries, there's a pressing practical need to move in this direction towards the single budgetary and banking system they need to make their currency work. If somehow Brexit is stopped in its tracks, we can expect a long stream of instances where we will be outvoted on our national interests overridden by the voting strength of others. Even where we secure protection and opt-outs in EU directives, the relentless federalism of the European Court of Justice would continue to drive further political integration, whether we wanted it or not. Our net contribution would inevitably rise well beyond the 10 billion a year we already pay, with the real possibility of the UK being drawn into future bailouts if the days of banking and sovereign debt crisis recur in EU member states. So in conclusion, in preparing this speech over the weekend, I reflected on that day two and a half years ago when I was one of five ministers to emerge from the Saturday morning emergency cabinet meeting to pledge my support for the campaign for the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. I made that decision because while we remain a part of the EU, no matter how we, who we vote for, there are many things that we simply can never change. The centuries-long struggle between Crown and Parliament was to establish the principle that no law should be passed nor taxes raised except by our own representatives. But our membership of the EU means vesting supreme lawmaking power in people we do not elect and cannot remove. People in almost all cases we cannot name and who we've never even heard of. And this transfer of power happened without real consent. When the UK joined the EU in the 70s, very few people would have been aware of the scale of the political project envisaged by the founding fathers of the European Union. Over the succeeding decades, significant transfers of power have been made via a series of incremental steps, deliberately disguised as technical changes, unlikely to attract widespread attention. As Jeremy Paxman put it in a, in a documentary aired during the referendum, British national sovereignty has gradually slipped away over time, piece by piece. We needed a referendum to determine whether there was consent for that big constitutional change, and we received the message back that there was not. Now is the time to implement the result, pass the withdrawal bill, and get on with the work of building a global future for the United Kingdom. Thank you. I'm sure there'll be many questions, much uh, discussion, and indeed a bit of disagreement. Um, <laughs> can I just get a sense who wants to ask questions? Just get as many. Gentlemen there, front row. Name an organisation. 
uh, Ben Laurie from the newsletter in Belfast. Um, you, Theresa Villiers, mentioned the various uh, efforts that the British government has gone to uh, to alleviate the border. And um, Arlene Foster, you were saying how they won't succeed, those who are trying to use this as a weapon. But it seems, as an observer at times, that they're alarmingly close to succeeding in many of the things in Dublin's extremely aggressive tactics. And I just wondered what you thought about the notion that the, actually the British government has been rather weak in, res in response to this aggression. I think that's one for you, Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we need to continue to make the case that the positive case for settling this in a sensible way it is in nobody's interest to introduce you know, unnecessary new physical infrastructure or checks at the border. Um, as I set out in my speech, we've now got a range of experts telling us there is a way to do this. We should, we should not let the politics of the situation and the understandable wish of, of you know, the EU to keep us in the single market, that shouldn't you know, be used as, as a block against coming up with a workable solution because you know, we will all, you know, none of us want that that new physical hard border to be introduced. There is a way that we can avoid that. We need to get on with, with delivering that and trying to take the, the, you know, the politics out of the situation in relation to the UK government, the Irish government, and the European Union. Well, I think the, the narrative around the border has been very misleading. Um, I, I mentioned imagery, and you often talk, uh, you often hear um, phrases such as no return to the borders of the past, but you and I both know that the borders of the past were there for a completely different reason. Mm -hmm. They were there for security reasons. They were not there to stop the flow of milk up and down um, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. They were there for a completely different reason. Uh, and therefore, I think you need to go uh, into the 1960s to see actually how things happened before the troubles took hold uh, and to see the way in which people were able to trade very easily across the border before we entered the European Union and before we had the troubles which we've suffered from uh, over this past 40 years. So of course there are solutions, there are rational solutions, there are pragmatic solutions uh, to moving forward. Uh, but I think our worry as unionists have been, and you referred to it, the very, very aggressive nature of the Irish government. Uh, that has been a change. It has to be said from the last government, from Enda Kenny's government, it has been quite aggressive and that leads a lot of unionists in Northern Ireland to think, is this just about the European Union or is it about something else? Is it about trying to claim the fourth green field in terms of Northern Ireland? So uh, that's something uh, that we keep very much to the forefront of our mind. But if it's just about the European Union, if it's just about our leaving the European Union and how we manage that, uh, then of course we can find solutions to that. Gentlemen at the front. Name and organisation. Thank you. Owen Bennett from Half Post UK. Arlene, you're someone who's seen as a very good negotiator. If uh, Trues may ask, would you go over to Brussels and start taking part in some of the negotiations to try and solve this Irish border issue? Theresa, would you support that? Because Arlene's got a very clear idea of what she wants. Uh, well, of course, it's for the government, and I'm not part of government. I'm not, I'm not even a member of parliament. Uh, so therefore, it is for the government to negotiate on behalf of the United Kingdom. But of course, uh, if and when, and she does ask for our view uh, in relation to a number of things, we shall give that view very clearly, as we did in December. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a matter for, for the government to lead the negotiations, but I know they take very seriously the need to engage with the leadership of all the uh, devolved areas around the country. It is very important that we, we work together in delivering on this hugely important process we've undertaken. Gentlemen at the end there, second row. <clears throat> Name and organisation. Uh, Stephen Swinford at The Telegraph. Um, Arlene, a question for you. Just uh, Boris Johnson has described the customs partnership as crazy. Do you agree with that analysis and do you have a view particularly on whether that's Max Back is better than the customs partnership for the border issue? Well, of course, these issues are being uh, discussed uh, at Cabinet at the moment. We have been very clear with the Prime Minister that our red line, and I referred to it uh, in my speech, is around uh, making a difference between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom, because constitutionally, of course, that would be unacceptable to those of us who are very strong unionists in Northern Ireland, but economically catastrophic for Northern Ireland as well. 72% of the goods that leave the port of Belfast go to Great Britain. 
you know, we cannot have uh, a border down the Irish Sea, which prevents that. So that's why in the text in December, it was very much uh, our aim to have that free and unfettered access piece, which is in that text in December. That was very important for us. Uh, how that is managed is, of course, a matter for the Cabinet, uh, and they will come forward with that. We will have our views in relation to all of that, but we haven't reached that point yet. Did you want to say anything, please? Um, I, I my, my preferred option is the so-called max fact one, the, uh, but you know I, I accept that it's important to keep both options on the table for the moment. Um, my concerns about the customs partnership are, you know, to a large extent, technical. Mm. Um, the, the I think the issue with the max fact, the streamlined arrangement, is that it does, as I mentioned in my speech. One element of making it work in relation to the Irish border is some kind of exemption for small local traders. Um, and that is, you know, I'm not sure, something that the, e the EU is, is willing to sort of accept for the moment. But I think it's important in terms of making the case for the MaxFAC option to make, make clear the fact that you know, I, there's already a border, there are already risks that are associated with it in terms of smuggling, and they're managed effectively by cross-border cooperation. So I think the sort of message that needs to go out to the EU is we, we respect where they have genuinely concerns about the integrity of the single market and allowing a back door into the single market through some kind of local trader exemption. But I think it is clear that we can manage those risks in relation to sort of potential smuggling and wrongdoing through cross-border cooperation. So if that's, that's the one blockage, then we need to send the signal that it is manageable. We can make that work. Of course, you know, we, we respect the concerns that the EU has about the integrity of the single market, but you know, it, it, there is a way to manage and maintain and ensure that people living in border counties can continue their daily work without a way, without somehow um, introducing a level of disruption and, and smuggling, widespread smuggling into the EU. Gentlemen there, name and organisation. Thanks. Uh, Kevin Scofield from Politics Home. Um, uh, Arlene, we're told that last week um, when Theresa May was speaking to Jacob Rees Mogg about Brexit, she told him that she wasn't as confident as he was that the unionist side would win any border poll. What would be your message to the Prime Minister about that bit of stealing her spine about that one? Well, I was asked about that last week, and as I said then, that was pure speculation. I mean, I don't know what went on between uh, those two individuals, but what is very clear, a couple of things are very clear. First of all, I, I fundamentally believe that Theresa May is a very strong unionist. Uh, why do I say that? Um, she made her comments as she went in to Downing Street as Prime Minister, saying that she valued all parts of the union, and she didn't do that after the Confidence and Supply Agreement. She did it long before the Confidence and Supply Agreement. So I believe that she is uh, a strong unionist. Uh, but secondly, as, been, as has been shown today by a couple of polls, um, you know, there is uh, no uh, discernible shift in terms of support for the union. Um, uh, whilst we can talk about those who voted remain and those who voted leave, the key element of unionists who, who voted to remain within uh, uh, the European Union is that they still very much want to remain within the United Kingdom. Um, and they're very clear about all of that. Uh, whenever I speak to people in Northern Ireland, um, speak to remain voters, a lot of them get quite angry when their vote has been interpreted in a way um, that they never intended it to be interpreted. So in other words, they voted to, to stay in the European Union. They did not vote to leave the United Kingdom, and they're very clear about that. In fact, some of them have said to me that they would change their vote if they were asked again because they're so angry about the fact uh, that their vote has been interpreted in that way. So there is no um, evidence that there has been a change in that direction. Yes, there's been a lot of hyperbole from, from nationalism and republicanism in Northern Ireland, uh, but there's no discernible change. Gentlemen, front row, name and organisation. I'm Nick Lawson, Sunday Times. Um, Ali, you raised, I don't know your exact words, you've got it in front of you, but you said something like the only people raising the issue of renewed terrorism at the border are people who want to uh, unpick yeah. the union. Yeah. Uh, that's not our impression here. We hear this almost every day in the House of Lords from Conservatives, such as, for example, Lord Patton. It's hinted at by John Major, it's hinted at by Tony Blair, 
it's, it's, we don't hear it from Sinn Féin particularly. So I'm, I'm not sure you're right when you're saying the only people who are doing this. It, and, and I wonder if you could comment on the fact that these very established figures just down the road in the House of Lords are the people most often making that allegation. Yeah. And I do think it's quite disgraceful that they use Northern Ireland in that way because they know that that's not the case. Um, and I think uh, one of the most bizarre uh, pieces around the referendum in Northern Ireland is when the Remain campaign sent Tony Blair and John Major to London Derry uh, to speak uh, in favour of Remain in the European Union because if they thought that those two individuals were going to shift uh, people uh, to vote Remain, I thought it was quite bizarre. Um, <coughs> Look, people will use whatever argument that they can muster to make an argument, um, particularly Remain voters. I mean, I, I had this experience recently where I was at a, an event in Queen's uh, for the anniversary of the Belfast Agreement, it was 20 years ago, uh, and we had a speech from Bill Clinton talking about the importance of democracy and the importance of respecting democracy, and this was so important, and that's what was so important in Northern Ireland. And then literally five minutes later, after agreeing with Bill Clinton, Tony Blair said, yes, and I'm going to overturn the Brexit <laughs> vote. And I thought, can you not see the irony in all of that? You know, you have to. I mean, the point is a vote has been taken nationwide. So let us respect that vote. Yes, let us also, as Theresa said, respect the fact that 48% of the people didn't vote in that fashion. But let us create a United Kingdom that is a global player and one that we can all be proud of in the future. Instead of talking, this is a bet noir of mine, talking places down instead of looking for the positives. Uh, and that has been the case in Northern Ireland. I've always been very positive about what we can do in Northern Ireland economically. Um, and uh, if we had more time, Chairman, we would talk about the whole issue of the Barnard formula and what we could do to try and move Northern Ireland away from dependence on the state and, and to become more economically beneficial. Um, but it is uh, wrong of people like John Major, like Tony Blair, uh, to do all of that. Very wrong indeed. Theresa. Uh, and I'd certainly advise those peers to listen to Lord Trimble. Yes. You know, a towering figure in the peace process, Nobel Prize winner, who has counselled against these kinds of sort of easy statements about the potential impact of leaving the EU on restarting the troubles. There just isn't the evidence for that. And I think some of the people who themselves have had a, a strong and positive part to play in the peace process should should take real care um, before they make the sort of statements that you've referred to. I see a lot of other uh, questions. Some people have been waiting uh, patiently. Someone at the back there. Hi there, it's Duncan Robinson from The Economist. Um, we've talked about how a uh, border in the IOC is unacceptable, uh, but Northern Ireland doesn't have, for instance, gay marriage. So why is it okay for there to be a border in the IOC when it comes to gay rights, but uh, a border for customs good is unacceptable? Well, of course, that's a devolved matter and something that uh, if we had a devolved institution, I've no doubt would be on the floor of the Assembly for debate. I mean, we have uh, a devolved settlement now and therefore it is important that that is respected um, and that we have diversity within uh, the four constituent parts. And I've no doubt if we had an Assembly back, which I hope we do very soon, um, that that will be a matter for discussion and it will be decided by those people who represent the people of Northern Ireland. I see quite a, there's a gentleman been waiting patiently in the middle there, on the side. Somebody? Yes, further down. <laughs> Just there, yeah. Hi, you, you obviously support the Max. Name Pack. an organisation, please. Oh, sorry, Jeff Evans, no actual organisation. Oh, nothing is related to the discussion here, but just an interested observer. For Max Pack to work, we've heard that the technology you described will take several years. We may need to go, the customs union, we may need to continue to be part of a customs union beyond the transition phase. Would you support that? And how would we ensure that the EU and the Irish government would also help create the you know, technology necessary to make MAXAC work, given it's actually in their you know, beneficial best interest to actually for us to have to remain in the customs union? Go first. Um, it, I think it's vital that the work is done now to prepare us for these options. Uh, I accept that it's going to 
take time to get them ready. Possibly the, the bigger challenge is ensuring that they're ready on the other side of, of uh, in, within the EU for these options. But you know, we have to be seen to be preparing for them so that we are ready to go to implement the result as soon as the end of the implementation period occurs. Now, I, I think it's, it's not unreasonable for the, the Prime Minister to be considering some kind of temporary extension of, of the customs relationship. I think if that is ultimately the road we have to go down, I hope that we don't. Um, it is going to be vital that it is time limited um, going into it for an indefinite period with, um, with you know, only the EU allowing us uh, out, I think would be problematic in terms of properly respecting the result. So that, that would be my response on those two particular issues. We need to be preparing the technology now and also if, if we do have to go down this pathway of a temporary further extension of some form of implementation period which involves staying in the customs union. That must be time limited at the start and there can be no question of going into it for an indefinite period with um, dependent on the EU's permission to come out of it. Uh, yes, I think that's critical in times of uh, there has to be a backstop on the backstop, as it were. Um, I think it's important that uh, we all have a clear view, not just for politicians, but of course for businesses in particular. They will want clarity on all of this. Uh, and therefore it is vitally important that if that is to happen, um, then that there is clarity in relation to the timing of it um, for businesses in particular. Just a couple more questions, I'm afraid. I'm sorry to have to disappoint if you want person there in the middle. Well, the lady there. Sorry, my neighbour has actually asked for a lot longer before we, but anyway. Um, I don't have any affiliation, Maggie Byrne. I just wanted to ask about freedom of movement of people. Mm. Um, there's been reference to this, we're not going to have a hard border, and a lot of discussion, although, as you say, still to come, the technology about uh, transport, com communication and commerce. But how are you actually going to control movement across this border of people without having a hard border? Thank you. Just one, mm. just one more question. There was somebody on the other side down there. Sorry, we've got to cut it off. Yeah. Um, I'd like to just take you back. Name an organisation. Oh, sorry, Patrick Thomas, uh, House of Commons Committee Office. Um, if I could just take you back to devolution um, side of things. Um, You'd be aware that Carwin Jones and Nicola Sturgeon sort of came out against the original Clause 11 um, in the yeah. EU withdrawal bill. I wondered if you would have joined with them in that. Whether you think that the agreement that the Welsh, which was good enough for the Welsh Assembly, but not the Scottish Parliament, would be good enough for the Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, and finally, um, what role do you think that the Northern Ireland Executive and um, Assembly should have? in setting common frameworks in areas like agriculture going forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, Maggie's question, uh, obviously in terms of the freedom of movement of people, we have the common travel area which predates um, the, our entry into the European Union, so that will deal uh, with that issue, so people who live on either side of the border can come across to work and that will work very well. Obviously the fact that we're outside of Schengen as well, both of us helps in relation to the security issues uh, and that's how we will deal with the uh, people moving across the border backwards and forwards. In in terms of the original Clause 11, I think the changes that were made and which now have been accepted by Wales have been helpful changes. I think uh, from our perspective, I can't say if the whole of the Northern Ireland Executive would have signed up to them. I'm certainly not going to speak for Sinn Féin uh, in relation to those issues, but I think from our perspective we were content um, with the amendments in the House of Lords to those uh, changes. Uh, in terms of the Northern Ireland Executive, uh, if we were up and running again, obviously we would take a full part in the the Joint Ministerial Council, which we don't at the moment, so that's a gap, uh, a gap which I very much regret, uh, because we do need to look at those UK frameworks and then work down to our own piece, particularly in relation to agriculture. You're absolutely right. Agriculture plays a key role in the Northern Ireland economy. We are 3% of the population of the UK, uh, but uh, you know 10% uh, 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 in terms of our GDP depends on agriculture. So. It's, it's a huge piece for us uh, and we very much will be working with Michael Gove and others to make sure that we're not disadvantaged in relation to that. 
and I think the, the first question raises a particularly important point because it illustrates that actually the problem with the border now is not about people. It's a, it's a, it's a particular issue with EU concerns about the integrity of the single market and goods coming in that haven't been subject to single market rules, customs, etc. Um, that that is the that is the problem with which we're grappling, um, because in in essence, in relation to uh, the common travel area. It's, it's clear on all sides that actually this isn't going to be an issue. We do not need physical checks of people coming over our land border. We never have done. We have always, throughout the history of the common travel area, cooperated with the immigration authorities on both sides in a shared endeavour to police the external boundaries of the common travel area. And if our rules on immigration change in the future, what is likely to change is not people coming in. Uh, the likely change is the right to live long term and work in the United Kingdom. And uh, you police and enforce those rules through a range of um, means, many of which, and indeed most of which, have nothing to do with physical checks at a the border. They're about renting property, um, complying with the rules on, um, on legal working. So I think it, it's, it's quite important to note that issues around the common travel area has, have dropped off the negotiating agenda because everyone knows that we can fix it because it's not a problem for the British side and it's not a problem for the EU side either. So that's why I think it's, that's an encouraging part of the, the discussion. Um, on um, devolution, clearly it's important that we reflect as a country on how we divide the powers coming back from Brussels as between Westminster at the centre and the devolved uh, administrations around the UK. And it is important that we ensure that we can continue to maintain the integrity of the UK internal market and running our own trade policy also mm -hmm. act, involves being able to act as one United Kingdom on certain matters. Um, and so I think the compromises that have been put forward which split responsibilities and competencies between Whitehall and the devolved administrations are, are a reasonable way forward. As ever with these things, there will no doubt be negotiations in the future as to whether the, the, the split of responsibilities stays. But one thing that we can look forward to is, assuming we go ahead and implement the result of the referendum, we will have more decisions being made locally by locally elected ministers in, um, in the devolved areas, which is another reason why it's vitally important to get Stormont up and running again so those powers can start to be exercised. Thank you. Arlene, thank you for your keynote. Theresa, thank you for responding. Thank Please you. join me in expressing appreciation. <laughs>